Hey everyone, welcome back to Realms Remembered. This is Michael T. Bradley. You're probably gonna hear some street noise in the background and that is okay. We can live with that. It's uh, one of the many reasons that I haven't recorded in a while is because it has been ungodly hot here in Portland and so I've had my window open all the time it's currently, we're actually right now getting a respite from it, and it's awesome, and I am like, I am not closing that goddamn window for anything. Anyway, yeah, it's been a while. I, I'd let everyone know it was going to be quite a bit before the next one came out. Honestly, I was uh, expecting it to be closer to June <laughs> when I released one. It's August 15th right now, and who knows when this will actually get out. I'm kind of thinking about the passage of time. It's like, man, it might be 40 before this damn thing is through. <laughs> but that's okay. That's fine. We're, uh, we're all enjoying the ride, right? We've finally made it to 4th edition. Oh, hey, the other thing that I've been really busy with, if you haven't noticed what the film, that's the podcast I have been working on a lot. Uh, over the past six months or so, and I'll put a link to that in the description so that you can take a look, check it out if you have not already. But for now, let's go ahead and start talking about the realms again. That's right, it's fourth edition, everybody. This is the entire point of this experiment, was to see, if we go through it in order, will fourth edition feel less ridiculous than it did when I tried to jump in years ago, back when it had first come out. And uh, obviously, first few episodes is going to be a little too early to tell, but I think there's probably no better place to start than 1478. We're going to finish off the Haunted Lands trilogy by Richard Lee Byers. And first, let's go ahead and talk about Realms of the Dead. I think this is our last anthology, unless you count that one, the, like, D&D one, where they had a few Realms stories in it, but it was done by, I, I think, uh, more popular authors or whatever. I'll at least check that out, because I'm curious about it, but I don't think it technically counts as a Realms anthology. So I think Realms of the Dead is the last one. And Realms of the Dead is, as far as I know, the last anthology to include 3rd edition and earlier. There's, I think there's some 13th century stuff in there. They, it just bops all over the place, and it's, it, I, I don't really know why. It's got a lot of stuff. Let's go through what's in there really quickly. First story is Pieces by Richard Lee Byers. This is a uh, Barreras and Mirror kind of doing a little investigative research. Uh, or uh, uh, They're in kind of like a detective story. It's decently clever. It's got a couple of cute little twists. Soul Steel by Lisa Smedman. Honestly, I don't think I made it through that one. It was just kind of, I don't know, it just didn't work for me. I wish I remembered more to say more about it, but it just, I don't know, it seemed very like... I am a realm short story, la 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 la. <laughs> the Resurrection Agent by Aaron Evans. Oh my god, this one was really, really, really good. It was such a cool idea. It was kind of a, like, imagine a Mata Hari who goes in expecting that once she gets the information she needs, she will die. But the, uh, the people who hired her, or I guess, you know, her organization, more likely, will keep a part of her body and they can use, like, a finger or whatever, and from that they can resurrect her. And it's like, oh, that's really, really nifty. That's such a fun idea, and it makes sense. And it's using the magic of the world that's a little crazy at times in a way that, I mean, like, it's entrepreneurial for the realms, right? I really, really like that idea. And the story itself was very meaningful, powerful, a sweet little, I don't know, sweet isn't the right word. I remember it stirred some emotion. So I'm looking forward to Aaron Evans' work. Wandering Stones by Bruce Cordell. I'm not usually a huge Cordell fan, but this one was kind of uh, interesting. Very moody, very atmospheric, and I enjoyed that. I liked the place setting that he used. The Bone Bird by Jalee Johnson. Oh, hell, I was going to look that up again to make sure I pronounced her name correctly. I hope I got it right. It was definitely right in the other one where I uh, talked about the interview that I did with her. This one was uh, decent. Again, really good imagery. This one was a very image-centric sort of anthology. The, uh, the one thing overall that I really disliked about this anthology is, as I've said before, I find the undead boring as hell. But I thought a few of these had some really interesting ways to bring the undead into it rather than just then they fought some zombies. Feast of the Moon by Christopher Rowe. Honestly, I don't remember that. A Prayer for Brother Robert by Philip Athens. This one was... <laughs> Philip Athens is just so... 
goofy and fun when he wants to be, and that was definitely the feeling that I got from this. It's kind of sort of a haunted house story starring a somewhat cowardly priest, and there are zombie hands that attack someone, and I thought this was such a weird crazy idea and I was like oh only fill up Athens but then in another thing that I read for the realms for fourth edition a group of zombie hands showed up as well so I guess that must have been just a monster from 4e that I don't know about because I I, I, I ran one session of 4e or, or, or maybe two maybe two I think it, it didn't go very far but everybody really liked it one of these days, we're going to have to do <laughs> either an entire recording or maybe I'll do like one book that I have more than usual to say on or I skip a lot in a row or something like that. But I'm definitely going to have to do one on why I love 4E and I will I realize that saying that I'll have to lay out a defense. So I'm prepared for that. I think that's definitely going to come. The King in Copper by Richard Baker. That's another one I totally don't remember, but I generally like Richard Baker's stuff, so let's assume I dug it. Dusty Bones by Rosemary Jones. It started off okay, but it just never really... It, it was trying to be really goofy and fun and self-aware, but I felt like it just kind of got bogged down in and then they fight a lich or whatever it is. The Many Murders of Manchun by Ed Greenwood. It was Ed Greenwoody. A Body in a Bag by Eric Scott to be. Again, I don't really remember it. That's sad because I usually uh, at least appreciate to be stuff again. Let's just assume that my memory is bad and it was great. Irula Dune by R.A. Salvatore. Didn't really read it because I don't care. Wasn't that the place that the halfling and uh, what's her name were trapped though? Irula Dune? Maybe this is about that. I don't care. All right, so let's finish off the Haunted Lands trilogy. Unholy, that is right. Unholy, holy, holy, holy. Richard Lee Byers, as many of you know, uh, is not my favorite Realms writer, but I really, really enjoyed either book one or book two of this trilogy. I can't remember which. I think it was book two. Sad to say, book three just really didn't do much for me. It was just kind of like, yep, we're going to fight a lot of monsters. That's that's something about <laughs> this trilogy in general. He keeps pulling out these monsters where it's like, whoa, what the hell? And you can... F it, it felt as if he, like, got a new Book of the Undead and was like, yeah, I'm gonna do this, like that giant ghost head thing or whatever from the... I think the second one and then the uh, um oh man this wasn't this wasn't the other one that had zombie hands but there were all sorts of things <laughs> all throughout this and uh and it was just uh it was just bizarre but you know whatever i mean i don't i don't really care the main plot suffers for me for a few reasons first of all the main thing is that what's her name tamath i think died in book two and so the love story isn't there anymore and there's not really much done with the surviving guy who's now pretty much immortal, Barreras. You know, because he's like some form of undead, I can't even remember who became what. Like, everybody became some form of undead or was a half-elf or whatever. I think he became something. Like, he turned all white and was creepy and now he and Mira go around and have barely two emotions to rub between them. But in any case, he was just so, like, dead inside because of circumstance that there's nothing really done with him being dead inside because of losing her so it just felt he wasn't very interesting as a character post her a hundred years have passed basically and so there's just i mean everything ties into book two but it feels so separate from it that it wasn't there was no sense of immediacy possibly that's because i waited eight months to read it but on the other hand they came out a year apart right so I just didn't, I felt no immediacy and I didn't really care because it's like, in the end, I, you know, th th there's debate through the book whether Sazzy's big plan is actually going to like, oh god, I can't even remember now, is it, is it that it's gonna like destroy all of Thay? And I think he thinks it's going to destroy the entire world and make it just emptiness and destroy himself or whatever. I'm kind of getting it mixed up with the Warhammer End Times books because there's kind of a similar discussion going on in at least the first book of that. You know, Nagash wants to destroy everything and some of the people working for him are like, man, I was really fine working for Nagash because he was source of all evil and I'm evil, I guess, but destroy everything? That's a little, meh, I don't know if I want that. So... 
you know, it's it's whatever. There's kind of a debate between whether it's going to just take out Fey or the entire universe. And it's like, well, I know it's not going to take out the entire universe. And I don't really give a damn about Fey, So I don't really give a damn about anything here. The one thing that I did like about the book is that Malark, the character who I've talked about liking before because he was part of that cult of the death happy or whatever, you know, I mean, they just, they, they seek out death or whatever, or, or they envy death. I don't know how best to put it. Anyway, he, he's like, yay, death would be cool. And he bites people and he views it as a gift. He gives them if he murders them. So, and I don't know, he just seemed like an interesting character. And in the second book, or actually, I think it's at the end of the first book, is it? Uh, hell, I don't know. At some point, he goes over to Sazzy's side because he realizes Sazzy is trying to bring about the end of everything. And he's like, awesome, you know, many birds with one stone, right? And uh, the thing that I enjoyed was that he becomes the big bad. Sazzy gets trapped by him in a very Doctor Who, Pyramids of Mars sort of way. And uh, our protagonists have to rescue Sazzy. And they're like, we don't really want to work with you. But Sazzy's like, eh. My shot at doing this is already passed and screwed up, so, you know, I promise to let you go, and I just got a (laughs) country of zombies to run now, you know, and uh, what are you going to do, right? So anyway, uh, uh, I liked that Malark became the big bad. My problem was that there was really nothing more to it than them being like, boy, that sucks. Anyway, get him, you know? I mean, there was no, like, oh, this is my brother, and, you know, any of that sort of shit. It was just kind of like... Ho hum, we gotta get this done, I guess. So, meh, what ifs, right? The other thing that I didn't really care for was I liked Auth and his Griffiny sort of stuff in the first couple of books. I mean, I at least enjoyed like how it was kind of building, obviously, to the Brotherhood of the Griffin stuff. In this book, the Brotherhood of the Griffin exists, right? I mean, they're there, and he runs it, and I couldn't tell any of the characters apart. I didn't enjoy any of those characters, and nothing about it seemed interesting to me, so I am now already kind of predisposed to dislike the Brotherhood of the Griffin series, which is going to suck if I don't like it, because that's what, like six books, I think, beyond this one? So I'm hoping that once we get to the Brotherhood of the Griffin series, he's able to kind of flesh them out in a way that is more interesting, uh, especially to me. So yeah, just none of them stood out. I just felt like, I don't know, I guess this book was almost kind of paint by numbers. It just felt like, "Eh, yeah, I guess I need a a climax to it. But really, for me, the climax came with, I I think her name's Tamith, uh, Tamith's death and uh, what happened in book two. I guess it's kind of the, the Star Wars curse, right? You know, it's like everybody loves the end of Empire because it, it feels so momentous. And then most people don't like Return of the Jedi as much because you gotta kind of wrap everything up and everybody has a happy ending or whatever, right? I actually prefer Jedi, but I don't know what that says about anything. So, in any case, Unholy not a great ending to the trilogy, but, you know, I stuck with it all the way through. A couple of little notes that I pointed out. He mentions Shevarosh, God of Retribution, and I was like, what the hell? Like, I've never heard of Shevarosh. And I thought one of the main complaints about 4E was that they killed off tons of gods in the realms. You know, like, one of the defining things about the realms has always been that there's, like, 8 million gods or whatever. And I'm like, I think Shevarosh is a new addition. Even if it's not a new addition, we kept around the god of retribution. I mean, that to me is like, maybe realms is not as godless as we were led to believe. Another quote, because here on Realms Remembered, like to try to teach new words, this is definitely not one that I knew. Orogeny, not like erogenous. <laughs> O-R-O-G-E-N-Y. Orogeny. Orogeny refers to forces and events leading to a large structural deformation of the Earth's lithosphere due to the interaction between tectonic plates. So if you want to describe a volcanic eruption in a really dull and pedantic way, orogeny, or orogenic. I do want to get to one more book here, and uh, that's another book that's set in 1478, or else I just guessed on it. I honestly don't remember what my um, little marks meant, and I think some of them might have had dates that I didn't intend, but in any case, we're pretending this is 14, this is all 1478. I know Unholy was, it has it like down to the month. In any case, Godcatcher by Aaron Evans, which I was really excited about because I really liked her short story in 
Realms of the Undead, and and I will say I enjoyed Godcatcher quite a bit. It's one of the presents Waterdeep or whatever. I don't have that much to say about it because I I liked it because it showed potential. I didn't necessarily like the story itself. I thought it got a little too bogged down at times, especially the third act seemed a little padded or whatever. It, it kind of suffered from first novelitis, but overall the characters really jumped for me and I liked the twist of the way that she used the spell plague. There's this woman who claims to be a dragon, and kind of one of the big mysteries of the book is, was she a dragon who got turned into a woman and trapped in that form, or was she a woman who was transformed by the spell plague into thinking she was a dragon and gaining some draconic powers because of it? And it's like, either answer works and would have been fine, but just the idea of these kind of fallouts from the spell plague, right? I really enjoyed that, and I thought it was fun. And I liked the fact that one of the main characters is a dragon. One of the main characters is... I'm trying to remember, uh, is that guy, I think there was a half-orc. He was either a half-orc or a dragonborn. I think he was a half-orc. And one of the decently main characters, like the main character's uh, uh, landlord is a, oh god, what are they called, a raptoran, the uh, the, the bird people. And so it, it was fun to feel like, oh, this is a world alive with different races, which again, we just don't see that often, and I really, really enjoyed that. I love that she seems to embrace the fact that this world is alive with different races and cultures, and especially 4E, where we have even more of them loose on Toral. Also, it was fun seeing Waterdeep post Spell Plague because it is obviously changed but still the same. There's even actually, I think, a little mention in there where it's like, oh, this is exactly the same. Wink, wink, you know? <laughs> but whatever. The one thing that I really disliked about it is there's a little kind of wink nod to 3rd edition. Uh, they mention her lineage, essentially, because, like, the main character wants to be a mage, but kind of keeps being pushed toward being a rogue, and you find out that I think her mother's maiden name was a Skevron, so it's like, oh, she's part of that whole Tazzy and Shamu, uh, Tazzy and Shamu, that line of secret thieves, right? And it's like, yeah, yeah, I see what you're doing there, but I don't really need a wink nod, you know? I mean, because for people who haven't been as involved in third edition, it probably just seems like you ha I mean, it, it it's like you have to make the book understandable enough so that you don't need to get it. And for people who do get the wink nod, what is that? You know, it's like, ah, but they were all dead. Anyway, meh. So whatever. Uh, still, overall, I really enjoyed the book, and again, I thought it showed tons and tons of potential, and so I am very excited to read more from her. And in fact, I'm kind of hedging here because I have read more, and I'm ready to go for the next session, which includes Brimstone Angels, and I really liked it. Spoiler. But uh, we'll, we'll, I'll get to why and wherefore and have more quotes for you come next time. For now, this is Michael T. Bradley, Realms Remembered.